who have had the privilege of hearing specially from God. But this is the key. If the word of the Lord had come to all those people before it came to Jonah, it means that there is a connection between the word of the Lord that has gone before and the one that came to Jonah. There can be no contradiction in the word of God. So what that means is that if the word of the Lord came to Jonah, it cannot be different from that which has come before. If the word of the Lord comes to you today, it would to come in the form of a private revelation to you. And one of the surest tests, one of the most certain tests, whether it is the word of the Lord or not that has come to you, it will be whether it contradicts what has come before it. So if you, if you claim to have heard from God, if it contradicts anything that is in the scriptures, then know that it is not the word of God. So the word of the Lord, first and foremost, that came to Jonah, is connected with every single word that God has spoken before. Secondly, when you say the word of the Lord came to Jonah, I want you to focus on the word came. Because it means that before that material moment, Jonah had not heard from God. It means that before that material moment, Jonah did not have the word of God. And it also means that after that moment, Jonah did not hear from God. So at a specific time, and because there is a specific need, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. This is the point. The point is that any divine message is not a personal endowment of the prophet. Note this, a message that comes from God, it is not a personal quality. It is not a personal endowment. It is not a personal gift that the prophet has. That is, he cannot be walking by the street one day and you say, excuse me, Mr. Prophet, uh, give me the word of God. If he has not heard from God, if the, if the word of God has not come to him, then he cannot speak it. You know that there are many men of God in our own day and time, especially in Nigeria, who are under immense pressure to speak the word of God, especially when the, when, the, when the year is ending. The media people go to the prophets and the, and the men of God and they say, speak the word of God and prophesy on what will happen in the year 2020. Most of these people have not heard from God. And I am sure that 2020, this year 2020, actually revealed that truth. If the word of God does not come to you, you cannot speak it. It is not your personal endowment. It is not a personal attribute of the man of God or of a prophet. It does not have it all the time. It comes to you when there is a need and when God thinks it wise to speak to his people. So if God, God has not spoken to you or spoken to a man of God about 2020, he can say nothing about it because anyone who speaks only the word of God, then that person is God. So let it be clear. The word of the Lord comes. And if it does not come, you don't have it. It is not a personal endowment of the prophets. Now, the word of the Lord came to a man. We are told that the word of the Lord came to somebody. It came to Jonah. That was his name. And Jonah means dove. Perhaps that was why Jonah dove into the, the mouth of a whale, because his name is Dove. If you put this one on social media, now, I'm sure that a lot of people will be happy and they will shout, oh, Father Kingsley, please don't leave us, don't leave us. This is wisdom. Jonah's name actually means a dove. But this is the point, actually. The point is that a dove is a calm and a peaceful creature. And the man Jonah, the prophet Jonah uh, is a complete mismatch with his name. It is a misnomer because there was nothing dove-like about him. He was stubborn, he rebelled against God, and he turned his back on God. If we think a little, we'll just we'll discover that there are many people whose names 
do not match their persons. Jonah was one of such. His name meant a dove, and Jonah was not a peaceful man. That name Jonah is also mentioned somewhere else in the scriptures. In 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 26, we are told that Jonah prophesied before a king, Jeroboam. That is, in the history of Israel, the name Jonah, the son of Amittai, is mentioned. That is very key. Because it means that Jonah is not a figment of someone's imagination. It means that the story of Jonah is a story that we should take seriously because he was a man who lived at a particular moment in history. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah and said to Jonah, Arise and go to Nineveh and cry out against it. At least, arise and go to Nineveh and cry out against the sins of Nineveh. This is the question. Is it possible for Nineveh to sin? Nineveh is a city. Is it possible for a city to commit sin? Let this be very clear from the get-go, that every single sin is a personal sin. Every single sin is ultimately an individual sin. But it is possible to share in the responsibility of a sin with that sin. And how can we cooperate with a sin? When, first and foremost, we do not oppose the sin when we have, especially if we have an obligation to do so. One, you can cooperate in a particular sin when you, when you praise the one who is sinning. You praise them for their wickedness. You, you encourage them in their, in their wrongdoing and you, and, and you advise them to even do more. That's another way of cooperating in sin. And thirdly, one can cooperate in sin when you, you, you participate in it, whether directly or voluntarily. And in that way, the sin of a single man can become the sin of a majority. So if there was one man in Nineveh who was wicked and nobody opposed him, Rather, there were people who were encouraging him, who were praising him for his sins, who were advising him to do more. And then people submitted themselves and joined with him to participate in that sin, whether actively or voluntarily. Then what they become is that they, they become accomplices. And by so doing, they establish a structure of sin. The church calls it a structure of sin. So it is possible for a city to sin when they have created structures of sin. Slavery was a structure of sin. Racism is a structure of sin. Impunity is a structure of sin. There's a lot of impunity in our country. It is because there's a structure that allows it to go on unchecked. So, it is possible for a, sin, a city to sin. But there's another way it is possible for a city to sin. When a leader sinful. A leader is representative of his people. And when a leader takes action, he takes it on behalf of his people. That is why it is important to have godly leaders and God-fearing leaders. And um, we hope and we wish that we will have leaders from amongst us. Those who truly understand the word of God and fear God. So a city can sin. That's why God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh and cry out against it, cry out against the sins of Nineveh, because their wickedness have come up to me. What is the meaning of that phrase? Read it. Their wickedness have come up to me. That phrase means that, first and foremost, the particular wickedness of the people of Nineveh was not mentioned anywhere in the book of Jonah. But there was another prophet who was sent to Nineveh his name was Nahum, Nahum, the book of Nahum. And Nahum spoke about the wickedness of the people of Nineveh. He said that they were blood-tasty people, and they piled up bodies upon bodies. If you read Nahum chapter 3, verse 3, they piled up bodies upon bodies, and people stumbled on the bodies as they walked around on the streets. But... When the word of the Lord says that the wickedness of the people of Nineveh cry up to him, it means that 
their wickedness was smelling to the highest heavens. It means that there was a cry, there was a cry of accumulated iniquity, and that kind of thing will catch the attention of God. See, the scripture says that there are certain sins that cry up to heaven for vengeance. Their wickedness cried up to heaven for vengeance. I'll give you an example of those sins that cry up to heaven and catch the attention of God. The blood of Abel, the sin of murder, it cried up from the ground up to heaven for vengeance. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah cried up to heaven to reach the ears of God. The cry of the oppressed, when the children of Israel were in Egypt, God said that their cry reached his ears. The cry of the oppressed will reach the ears of God. Also, the foreigners, the widows, and the orphans, when they cry, God will hear. And finally, the scripture says that if an injustice is done to a wage, when you do that, if the person cries, his cries will reach God. So their wickedness cried up to heaven for vengeance. And we are told that when Jonah was sent, Jonah rose up and he fled. That is verse 3. That's where we are right now. But Jonah rose. Okay, The word of the Lord came to him and said, Arise, go to Nineveh, cry out against it, because their wickedness have come off to God. Verse 3 says, But Jonah rose and he fled to Tarshish. Look at verse 4 immediately. It says, But the Lord hurled a great wind. So, verse 3 says, But Jonah, verse 4 says, But the Lord. That is a very, very important detail that we must keep in mind. The beginning of verse 3 says, But Jonah, verse 4 says, But the Lord. That word, but, is one of my favorite words in the scriptures. Because I'll give you an example of how important God is. You say, someone, someone says something was lost, but now it is found. Someone was dead, but now he is alive. You say, someone could not see, but now he can see. But is a, is a beautiful word in the scriptures. It is even more potent. It is even better when you add God to but, or when you add the Lord to but. In the whole of scriptures, but the Lord appears about 60 times. But God appears about 45 times. In the book of Jonah, it is but the Lord. And what does it mean when it says but the Lord? Well, the Lord means that God in a powerful and in a compassionate way, he intervenes in the story of man. But the Lord means that whenever you see but God, whatever comes after it is radically different because God has inserted himself into the history of man. So if, for instance, you say to yourself, things were going bad for me, things were topsy-turvy, I did not have a direction in my life, but the Lord came to my rescue. Once that statement comes in, but God, everything else changes. I was sick, I was tired, I was broke, I almost gave up, but God showed up for me. So Jonah was about to flee to Tashish, but God sent a storm to stop him. Jonah was thrown by the sailors into the sea, but God sent a fish. But God is the most important two words that I find in this book of Jonah. But God. Now, when Jonah rose up, we are told that he fled. And God sent a storm. But how was he fleeing? We are told that 
in verse 3, that Jonah was fleeing away from the presence of the Lord. He was fleeing to where? He was fleeing to Tashish. Now, Tashish is in modern day Spain. And um, Tashish to the then world was like the ends of the earth. Tashish was the, was the farthest city on earth. So if somebody stood up and was fleeing to Tashish, meant that he had a mad determination to actually run away from God. Tashish was about 2,000 miles away from Palestine where Jonah lived. But the original place where God sent Jonah, which is Nineveh, is just about 500 miles from Palestine. So it teaches us a very strong lesson. And whenever we decide to go our way like Jonah did, sometimes we will have to pay for it four times and even more. Because if you check the distance between Tashish and Nineveh, where God said Jonah should go, 500 and 2,000 miles. So the one who decides to flee from God, in fact, he puts himself in more danger because the longer the journey, the more the danger. He pays more money for the journey and he puts himself more at risk. So he fled, or rather he intended to flee to Tashish. And the scripture says that he wanted to flee away from the presence of the Lord. That's three. Now, what is the presence of the Lord? It is very important to note that that thing that is called the presence of the Lord, it is either childish or naive or absurd to say that one wants to flee from the presence of God. And more than that, it is even an impossible task. It is impossible to flee from the presence of God. Jonah knew that it was impossible to flee from the presence of God. Next week, when we treat the prayer that Jonah said in the belly of the fish, we would understand that Jonah knew that it was impossible to flee from the presence of God. Because Jonah knew the Psalms. The Psalms were written during the time of David, and David, um, uh, David lived before Jonah. Jonah knew the Psalms. So he would have known Psalm 139, which says, where can I go from your spirit? Psalm 139 from verse 7 to verse 11. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I descend to the depths, you are there. If I take the wings of the wind and flee to the uttermost part of the earth, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say the darkness of the earth should cover me, even darkness is not dark for you, my God. And the night is as clear as the day. Jonah would have known that because he knew the Psalms. So how are we to understand the action of Jonah when he stood up and attempted to flee from God? We can only understand it when we place it side by side with what Elijah said. Elijah said in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, he says, As the Lord God lives before whom I stand, as the Lord God lives before whom I stand, the angel stood in the presence of God. The, the prophets stood in the presence of God. The priests, whenever they served God, they stood in the presence of God. To stand in the presence of God is to be at a position where you perpetually, where you perpetually serve God. So what Jonah was doing by fleeing the presence of God, he was saying that I refuse to stand in the presence of God as a minister. More than his fleeing from the presence of God, what Jonah was actually saying was that he renounces his ministry as a prophet. He rejects the message that God has sent to him. He refuses to serve. Remember the battle cry of Lucifer against St. Michael in the book of Revelation. Their battle cry was, I will not serve. That is, I will no longer stand in the presence of God and minister to God. In the scriptures, presence in a place is usually intimately connected with a willingness to serve God. 
presence in a place is connected with a willingness to serve. So when Jacob, for instance, says to, to Joseph, he says, come and I will send you. Joseph says in Genesis chapter 37, verse 13, he says, here I am. That is, I am present here, which translates to mean that I am willing to serve. The book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9 says, here I am, Lord, I have come to do your will. That is, I have come to serve you. That is, I am present here and I want to serve. What that means, my dear brothers and sisters, is that you cannot be present and not serve. You cannot come to church every day and not be doing some form of ministry. To be a Christian without ministry is a contradiction. A Christian who has no means of serving is a contradiction in terms. It is saying to God, God, I refuse to stand in your presence. I flee from you. So let us not check our responsibilities. Let us not neglect our duties because it will be tantamount to fleeing from the presence of God. So when Jonah attempted to flee from the presence of God, we are told that the Lord, that he went down to a place called um, Joppa. Verse 3. That's where we still are. He went down to a place called Joppa. What you find is that there will be a continuous reference to a downward movement. Once he made that decision to flee from the Lord, there was always a downward movement. Read verse 3. He went where? Down. He went down to Joppa. And when he got to Joppa, he paid his fares and he went down into the base of the ship, the hold of the ship. When he was in the base of the ship, he lay down as if to, to break away from the ship and, uh, and enter into the boat. When the sailors even took him and threw him into the sea, they threw him down into the sea. You see, he was going down and down. When the ship, when, when the fish rather swallowed him, he went down to the belly of the fish. So this constant repetition of a downward movement is an intentional repetition. It is meant to say one thing and one thing alone. And that is the fact that anyone who moves away from God is moving downwards. It is always a downward movement. Whenever we turn our backs from God, we are not moving horizontally away from God. Jonah thought he was going to the west. God said, go to the east. He said, no, I will go to the west. The east to the west is an horizontal movement, but that is physically. Spiritually, a movement away from God is a downward movement. So let us keep that always in mind. Also, we are told that he went to Joppa, he boarded the ship, and he was fleeing from the presence of God, but God sent a storm. You see, God does not ever lack the means with which to bring man back to his senses. For St. Paul, it was a light that struck him senseless from his horse. For Peter, it was a look. Peter was denying Jesus and when the cock crowed, we are told that Jesus turned his face and looked at him. That brought him back to his senses. For David, it was a parable. Remember the parable that the prophet brought to David. For Jonah, it was a storm. God does not lack messengers to send. What this means is that there are visible and there are invisible messengers that are the beck and call of God. They are standing at the ready and they are willing to do God's bidding. So God can send any of all these. Sometimes it is a disappointment that we experience in our lives. Sometimes it is the loss of someone close to us. Sometimes it is a sickness. God does not lack messengers to send. It was a storm that he sent to Jonah. But this is the most important point for me. And it is the fact that God sent a storm and the storm obeyed God. If a storm can obey God, 
then why can't Jonah obey God? If a storm can obey God, then why can't I obey God? Still eight. That so one forty eight verse eight that even the, the winds and the storm obey the voice of God. There's the beautiful song that speaks about, you know, the, the obedience of creation. That song is by Hillsong, and it's titled So Will I. I've been listening to it for quite a while, So Will I. It's very beautiful, it's very profound. It says that in the beginning, when God created, God spoke to the darkness, and the darkness obeyed and gave way for light. God spoke and he created the stars, the planets, and a billion galaxies, and they all obey the voice of God. And that God created a thousand creatures on earth. If all these things that God has created, if darkness can obey the voice of God, if the, the, the planets and the galaxies can obey the voice of God, if the creatures can obey the voice of God, so will I. I will do the same. If the mountains can bow before the presence of God, so will I. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If, if the oceans roar the greatness of God, so will I. If the winds go where God sends them, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. And even if all of these creatures of God, even if all their praises still fall short, I will sing a thousand billion times. Even if they do not obey God, I will obey God. So the point is that if all the creatures of God obey him, then why can't you? I think that stands out very clearly in the book of Job, in the book of Jonah. God spoke to the storm and the storm went and did the bidding of God. I think we have spent a while. I just quickly wrap up. Conclusively, I think that there is a phrase in the book of Jonah which is like a key. It ties it all up. And it's a phrase that you can easily gloss over. You might not even really see it, except you look very closely. We are told that when Jonah rose to flee in verse 3, that he went down to Joppa and he found a sheep going to Tashish, 